Okay. Yeah, so we have Nicole here. Um, she's a senior policy analyst for the Independent, Independent Women's Forum, and I believe you study um, voting trends for independent voters, right? Mm -hmm. And this is Omar Ali. He's a professor at Towson University. Um, he studies political science, but in particular, he's an expert on independent voters as well. And, and I'm, I'm interested in um, talking to you about not just independent voters with a capital I, but being politically independent with a small I, you know, how we can sort of get past the partisanship and the gridlock and really work together regardless of how you identify yourself and, and cooperate and get to those solutions that we need in order to move our country forward. So um, I want to start by asking um, Nicole to kind of give us a summary of what she's been seeing. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, Omar and I actually have been on, we've done CNN panels for the past three months talking about independent voters, independent voting trends. So um, there's, there's a lot of really interesting data out there. I also work for a polling firm, so um, I brought some recent polling data demographically, who independents are, what issues are important to them. Um, so I have, oh yeah, I have all that, sorry. Um, looking back, um, you know, obviously independents are the group that everybody wants to capture for the November elections. Um, in 1994, um, Republicans were 36% of the electorate and they won the election by a landslide. Contract with America, Newt Gingrich, all of that. In 2006, Republicans were 36% of the electorate, exact same thing, and they lost. I mean dramatically lost. Um, so what was the big difference? It wasn't um, trends by anything. You know, Republicans, you know, voted 91% for Republican candidates. Democrats voted 92% for Democratic candidates. It's, you know, that's just how party voters are. Um, it was the independence. The big switch was in 1994, independence swung 14 points for Republicans. It was 55-41. And in 2006, they swung the other way. It was 18 points for Democrats, 57-39. Um, so Obviously, they're going to be, as I said earlier, um, the, the vote that everyone is courting. Um, mm. You know, everybody is pretty aware of where the Tea Parties stand um, in terms of what party that they're likely to vote with. But independents are much more subjective. So, who are independents? Um, just sort of pulling overall information. Um, they are, in terms of race, they are slightly more white than the overall population, but not dramatically so. Um, age, they're actually interestingly slightly younger. 41% are under 45 versus 37% overall. Um, so I think what we've seen is that there are people of all stripes that are just, they're disillusioned with both parties for a number of reasons. With regard to ideology, 54% um, are moderate. So that tracks very well with what you were saying earlier, that people overall agree. People are not very extreme. There's not giant swings. People don't like, you know, they're not going to the mattresses to fight with each other. Um, of that, uh, or you know, the other the other percentage, there's um, approximately 26% are conservatives and 17% um, are liberal. So you could say that um, independents are slightly more center right. Um, you know, that's certainly up for debate. Um, as I said earlier, party ID, they're neither Republicans nor Democrats for a number of reasons. Um, I think the fact that they trend younger actually is interesting, particularly with people defecting from the Republican Party, because um, I have a colleague that's done a lot of research on young voters and people are just personally I'm not a Republican because I'm fed up with the social issues like that is a huge turnoff um, a lot of war issues gay issues some um, immigrant issues I think you know that's a really big problem for Republicans going forward and that's certainly something they have to address but mm -hmm. in terms of income religion it matches up with the overall electorate so you know this is not breaking news independents aren't this like big weird group of people um, what issues matter to them it's it's the economy. It's the economy, stupid. It's you know. It's it's that's again. It's no. It's not rocket science. So I'm not really sure why this is this big mystery to you know politicians. Um, people care about the economy. They care about jobs, and they're fed up with both parties because they don't think either party has a real solution. Um, corruption is a big issue. It's interesting when you ask um, independents which party do you, do you trust more on the issue of the economy? They, they lean slightly towards Republicans. If you ask about taxes, they lean slightly towards Republicans. If you ask about corruption, um, they, both, both independents actually will say neither party more than they will, they will lean either, either one way. 
Um, so trust is a really huge issue, and mm -hmm. that's been a big problem. Um, and mm -hmm. Democrats actually have lost that significantly um, in, in actually just the past six months, and that is going to be a real problem going mm -hmm. forward. Um, mm -hmm. It's not um, in terms of uh, you know healthcare, the, the healthcare issue. Um, Independents, their number one concern is actually backroom deals, and that um, when asked what they would repeal, if you know if you had to reveal specific provisions, um, when given a list. Independents say the backroom deals, so that's a big concern. Um, as you mentioned earlier, people are fed up with politicians, and they're fed up with the political process. They don't, you know, they don't think that they necessarily have the guts to move forward and actually affect big changes. Um, so entrenched interest, it's not just something we talk about in Washington. It's something that the rest of the country actually they get and they're disgusted with. Um, so currently, um, the generic ballot is favoring Republicans slightly over Democrats. Um, Unfortunately, independents right now are much lower, they're, they're less motivated to vote. Um, given a scale of one to nine, you know, how likely are you to vote in November? Um, Republicans are very motivated, Democrats slightly less so, um, independents much less so. So that's something that um, really, you know, we'll have to address going forward. Both parties, you know, all parties will have to address going mm -hmm. forward is, mm -hmm. you know, what, how, how to appeal to Republicans, how to get that trust and how to retain that trust. Mm -hmm. um, um, sort of, I mean, I can talk specifically about like healthcare. That's like a little bit boring. I think mm -hmm. everybody's sort of over healthcare. Um, <laughs> but you know, with, with the Supreme Court fight going forward, it's just I think the American people overall, but independent specifically, don't have the stomach for these big, awful, vitriolic battles anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. that's you know that's going to be really interesting how people handle themselves going forward and how to move past that awful you know strategic, well, if I give you this concession on health care, you know, mm -hmm. if, if I give you Medicare Part D, then what will you give me? The American people don't care about it, and independents don't care about it. They actually, they want change. They want moderate change. They want, you know, incremental change, but they want politicians to work for the better. They don't want them to work for themselves, their self-interest. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen, you know, poll after poll talking about how, how fed up with people are with incumbents. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's going to be another really interesting trend. So with Thank that, you. I will, you know, how do we affect sort of like, you know, overall change? Um, Omar's done a ton of terrific work on, so I will turn it over to him. Okay. Omar? Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Annabelle, for inviting us Thanks to come. Thanks for being here. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you all for coming. Um, this is what we should be doing, gathering around the country and asserting our voices in the ways that we can. Um, I've been independent for the last 20 whatever years um, since I was in college. I've been tracking the independent movement both as an activist and as a scholar. Um, I've written about it, I've studied it, I've been appearing on CNN and Nicole, which has been a lot of fun, giving a lot of exposure to just independence and sort of our history. Um, so I, you know, I, I wanted to, what I wanted to share was some of the issues and some of the concerns that independents have been raising and have been working on for a long time. It's not just the last few months, but for years. Um, and I think that there's some exciting things that are developing in terms of what you're describing in your, in your model, this, um, in terms of the overlap of concerns, shared concerns that Americans have. And I think what we're starting to see in America is the development of something that kind of gets rid of this whole left, center, right model versus a more top-down or inside-out model, if you will. And so I think your, your data supports that that there is a new kind of political culture that we're coming into, that we're creating, that has been underway for some time. And so I'm very, very happy to be here and to share some of what I'm about to talk about. If we want to make change in this country, we have to get together and we have to support people who are in positions of power who can affect changes. Independents are uniquely positioned because we hold the balance of power around the country. And that's been the case from the highest levels. President Barack Obama was elected with the margin of victory of independence. Locally, you see that around the country. In New York City, New York just elected the first independent mayor, Michael Bloomberg. Some people may, people may scoff at the fact that he's a billionaire. The fact is, is that the Democratic and Republican Party have so much money in their pockets and in their apparatus that it takes a billionaire, it takes a multimillionaire to actually compete. So in this way, I actually, I'm in slight disagreement with those folks who say that campaign finance is the solution. Mm -hmm. Because there are two kinds of political reform in America. 
There's the kind that cleans things up, that looks good for the politicians to seem like they're doing things, McCain, fine coal, you know, that whole thing about campaign finance, which basically levels the playing field for the politicians and the political parties. Right? There's another kind of political form that the independents have been supporting for a long time, and that's about bringing in new players, new voices, and creating new partnerships that break up this sort of partisan divide that we've been talking about and so we're so sick of, that brings people across the spectrum, left and right, center, however you identify, on shared issues of political reform. So what are those issues that independents have been raising and the specific fights that are taking place right now? A key fight right now that's going on is the issue of open primaries. In California, on June 8th, 3.4 million voters will have the chance to actually be included in the political system if Proposition 4 passes. This is an issue that's about structural reforms. Now often when I talk about structural political reforms, people's eyes glaze over, because they're not sexy issues. But if we think about it historically, and as a, as a matter of just fact, I'm actually a historian, not a political scientist. Oh, okay. um, you know, but I do a lot of political science-y kind of stuff. But if you look at the roots of this country, we're talking about issues of reform. We're talking about no taxation without representation. That's an issue of political process. It's not an issue of, of sort of an isolated issue in the sense of you know, social policy. It's reforming the process that we're concerned about. I think as independents. However we may see ourselves as liberals, as, as moderates, as conservatives, whatever. So open primaries is a key fight that's going on. And what it will do will bring in millions of Americans. In the case of California, 3.4 million. In New York, you have another fight. Uh, you have this issue of opening up or, or, or having nonpartisan municipal elections. Nonpartisan municipal elections would break up the party control in New York City. That's right now being reviewed by a Charter Revision Commission. So there are kinds of structural issues that are key to opening up the process. Now, on the one hand, I do think that the spirit of campaign finance reform is good. I don't like the idea that corporations you know, control so much of American politics. On the other hand, we've kind of been there and done that as a larger movement of independence <laughs> with a little eye. Not a big I, because I identify myself as an independent with a little I. Mm. See, if we didn't have the ability to actually raise money directly from Americans around the country, Obama probably wouldn't have been elected. He got, he got Americans to support, in the, in the, in the numbers of $700 million, um, his campaign. He wasn't supposed to have been the nominee, right? Hillary Clinton was supposed to be the Democratic nominee. But together, African Americans and independents, mostly white independents, came together around the country and in primary after primary, where there were open primaries, which includes about 22 states, they were able to eke out their margin of victory and win those primaries and then go on and win the general election. So in some ways, money isn't the problem. It's the parties. And I think Americans do know that at a gut level. That's what all the evidence seems to be suggesting, what Nicole's been talking about, what Phil is demonstrating, that we just don't like parties. As I said before, I think, on the CNN, it's really a question of the party versus the people, and that we're in a war right now against the parties. So what I don't want us to believe is that one party or the other is going to be the savior. I think the Tea Party is extremely misguided if they think that the Republicans are going to save the day, because there are people who are independent-minded in that group. And in the same way that I think that people think that the Democratic Party can be reformed, I think that there's a long history of, of showing otherwise. I think what we have to do is create new alliances across the board. The data does indeed support that. But I think it's incumbent upon the Coffee Party, and I'm just saying this as an American, to support issues of structural reform open primaries, getting an independent on the FEC, you know, nonpartisan municipal elections. I think term limits is also a great thing. These are ways of getting Americans in, new voices, new people, new partnerships. So with that, I'll just leave it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> OK. Um, let's see. I want you to kind of prepare your questions at this point. Oh, here, well, you guys keep that. Um, start preparing your questions while I. <laughs> ramble for a few minutes and um, also to everybody in cyberspace start submitting questions right now for this conversation that I think is very important. Um, the way I see it, there are a lot of people who just don't feel at home 
in the Democratic Party or the Republican Party for different reasons. I think there's a variety of reasons. That's my guess. And I call them politically homeless people because they haven't really had a home. I feel politically homeless myself because, and I think that that's what the coffee party has done, is that it's, you know, it's, it started out as a Facebook page. <laughs> And that's where a lot of activity is still happening. It's a Facebook page. And people would come to this page that just said, join the Coffee Party movement, just saying, finally, a place where I can just talk about politics <laughs> without being yelled at. <laughs> and I think that speaks to an intense sense of alienation people feel from the political process, but frankly, also from each other. We're afraid to talk to our family, friends, and coworkers about things that really affect all of us. You know, that we may get called names, we may get called a communist or a socialist or whatever, because we support healthcare. Um, I mean, that's the climate we're in right now. And until we figure out how to stop fighting and really start talking and thinking about solutions. We're just we're headed for a very bleak future, you know. And so that's what I would like to kind of focus our attention on for the time being is that how do we stop the fighting? You know, there's plenty of support, evidence to support that we don't need to fight, right? <laughs> right, Nicole? We don't need to fight, right, Phil? Yep. <laughs> you know? But we're fighting. And it feels like um, it's almost like we're addicted to the fight. You know, the media is very conflict driven. And so they're out covering the Tea Party rally today, you know, <laughs> because that's where the story is, that's where the theater is, that's where the fight is, right? But for people who just want to get to some solutions, and I think, you know, we're everyone in this room, all of us here, we want to, we're very interested in seeing progress. And if we just put our heads together, even in this room, I bet we come out with some really good ideas for how to stop the fighting and how to move our country forward, right? And I think it's really um, a responsibility that we have to be resolute about. Because it's tempting to do something theatrical for the media, right? You know? But that's, that, that just doesn't help us. That just continues the fight. So I would like to kind of open up the conversation with the panel and all of you with that question in mind, it's like, how can we all stop the fighting and come together and start cooperating? Because yeah, there are reasons to be angry at the government, at each other, at the two parties, at the tea party, even coffee party. Maybe some of you have issues with the coffee party. There are reasons to be angry, but that doesn't help, right? It just doesn't help to continue the fighting. And so that's what I would like to talk about today. So. Um, let's start with the live audience here. Um, Chair, do you want to grab this microphone? And feel free to ask questions to any of us, all of us, to each other. Anybody? Al, I know you have a question. Okay, I have a question. <laughs> Al Alborn, uh, independent voter. Uh, who watches a uh, member of the coffee party, watch coffee party and tea party activities closely, went to a tea party rally this afternoon. Uh, while I'm an independent voter in the center, my opinion is the folks on the ends of the continuum set the agenda, and I notice the vocabulary and culture is very different on either end. And I wonder if that affects our ability to communicate about issues because the meeting I was at, the rally I was at this afternoon at 12 was very different from the types of meetings the coffee party has. Cultural issues and how they affect our ability to communicate and come together. Do you understand the question? Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, I think the rhetoric is very, very important and um, that's something that I think we all need to take a conscious, you know, we need to make a conscious effort to watch our own speech, but then also to call our friends out when they're being incivil. Um, I have asked many of my Republican friends, just drop the isms, like drop the negative, like enough with the socialism and the communism, like just enough, like enough with that. At the same time, I think, you know, I, the fact that um, the Tea Party rallies are often derided as tea baggers, like that's also not really helpful. So I think, you know, we, we need to 
be conscious of that because it's that whole, you know, when you're a kindergartner, treat others as you would like to be treated. Um, there is no way to come to the middle if you're name calling because that you're, you're displaying just a basic level of disrespect for people. So mm -hmm. that's sort of my, my first and foremost proposition. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, How do we stop the fighting? <laughs> well, it's interesting because I, I think that at meetings, I think we need to figure out how to talk to each other, and I think that's that I've, I saw that, for instance, in the, in the mid 1990s, I was involved in looking at the Reform Party and that whole effort, which kind of exploded or imploded in 2000. And you know, it was the first time. I mean, I'm a progressive, politically speaking, but I was reaching out and working with people who were on the center, center right, rather. And what I found was actually a lot of those folks were actually a little bit easier to talk to than some of my liberal friends um, who I agreed with on programmatically on a lot of things. And it was a very important lesson because I realized that we could actually work on some issues together. And the thing that brought those folks together in the Reform Party was the issue of opening up the process. So I think that that's important in, in talking just one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. But I also think fighting is a good thing. But it depends, it's, it's about who we direct the fighting towards. Mm -hmm. And I think that we can't hold back or pull back our punches when we're talking about the power that the political parties have. Mm -hmm. So I think that the way we go is take our anger, and I think there's a lot of anger out there, and direct it towards the parties. And how we do that is by going out and voting on, you know, on election day and voting out people who we think are being excessively partisan, who are not supporting issues of political reform, who are not is you know, supporting issues that can help open up the process. So I think that that's where we need to put our fire. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm for anger. I think anger is a healthy thing. If you keep it inside, I don't know, something happened, maybe your brain explodes or something like that. You gotta, you gotta get it out, right? But I think it's how you direct the anger. But I think it's important in these meetings, I think we have to conduct ourselves in a civil way. I think that's absolutely important. But I think fighting is a very good thing. And if we didn't fight as Americans, we wouldn't have the changes that we have today. It's a fact of history, right? Slavery would not have been abolished. Women would have not gotten the right to vote. Labor rights would not have been won. Public education would not have been given. Environmental issues, all hosts of things were, de were the result of people fighting. But it was fighting directed towards certain things. Mm -hmm. And the things that they were fighting looked different over time. Right now, we're dealing with a bipartisan monopoly. Mm -hmm. There's nothing in the Constitution about political parties. And yet, these two political parties have effectively taken over our government, our system. Mm -hmm. So everything is bipartisan. If you want to run for office as an independent, you have to get 30 times the number of signatures if you're an independent than if you're a Democrat or Republican. Why is that? It's because the Democrats and Republicans work together, despite a lot of their public stuff about being you know, on this side and that side, to make sure that we're pushed out as Americans. So the fight is really about getting on the inside of power, and we want the Americans to be on the inside of power. That's us, us the Americans. So I think we do have to fight, but it's who we're fighting and who we're you know, directing our anger at. Something else to know, because you had mentioned about how the, the parties are sort of being driven by their extreme wings. Um, it, it will also be interesting to see how um, the Republicans, how they have reacted and how they will react in the future to the Tea Party movement. There has basically been a purge of the party where they're cannibalizing moderates. Um, you know, they're turning on Scott Brown in Massachusetts because he's voted for these bills. Um, obviously, the, the senators from Maine have, have really, they've, they've caught it sort of from both, from both sides. Um, and, and that's really troubling to watch as well, because um, a Republican in Texas is not the same as a Republican in Maine. A Democrat in Chicago is not the same as a Democrat in New York City. You know, so that will be interesting to watch how the parties adapt to, to, their, to their various extreme wings. Because um, you know, part of it is you know, the 24-hour the, the news cycle is it's, it's entertaining and it's funny to watch somebody get really upset. Um, I mean, I, I don't know. We've, we've gotten calls from CNN about like the census. They asked me about the census a few weeks ago. You know, what are your, what are your thoughts on that? Are you worried about that? What about the race thing? I said, I really don't think it's a big deal. They're like, you know, and that was, that was not appealing. I did not do that segment because that's not, you know, a sort of middle of the road moderate viewpoint is not something, that's not a news cycle. That's not something that can be played over and over again. So, um, you know, we have to demand accountability um, from, you know, be cognizant of who we elect, but then also demand accountability from those people when they're there. Um, Phil, do you want to add something to that? Um, cause sure. Here, I mean, why don't you take this one? Right. Yeah. Um, because you have worked with people on how to use 
use the information mm -hmm. to, oh sorry, I better use the mic, um, how to use the information to make it actionable. Yeah. So how we can have good outcome from this, like, you know, I think marriage counseling is a good kind of prototype. <laughs> I, I feel like the, the politics today reminds me of the film War of the Roses. You know, it's like a husband and wife just about to kill each other. And while they're killing each other, and meanwhile, I feel like there's flooding in the basement. And thieves have come in and they're taking everything in the house. So it's like, who cares who won the fight? Because everything's gone. And I think that's our future that we're facing. So. Well, that's a great analogy because they both died in the end. Oh, yeah, they did. They did. They died. <laughs> and, and that's that, a terrible analogy. No, that's a, that. no, it's really an excellent analogy because that's really what we face. I mean, uh, I, I agree totally with Omar's statements that we want to vote out of office people that are obstructing progress, that are obstructing the government even functioning. That's absolutely true. Um, when it comes to what we need to do, the, the fascinating thing with my work, and I'm not a political expert, so I'm sitting here with people who are political experts, is I'm looking at transformation. That's what my work is really about. And I look at it from a scientific standpoint, though I'm not technically a scientist, I, I look at how we can apply this, because when we look at where we are right now, we can't keep doing what we've done and get any different results. It's going to keep getting worse. The challenges America faces, the challenges we face in the world, are challenges we don't have time for too many more fights. So if we keep fighting, and, and we keep taking years and debating this and debating that, and we do go through this process, we're going to run out of time. These challenges, when we look at the world globally, and we look at America, we're facing unprecedented challenges in history. And they're not isolated challenges. That's why I use my little toy so much, because these challenges are all connected. Yes. If we try to fix the economy by lowering all of our environmental standards, it's going to have impact. We know how many people die every year from air pollution. We know how many people... There you go. We know that... Hundreds of thousands of Americans have heart attacks and strokes and they have asthma attacks because of air pollution. So fixing jobs at the expense of the economy is not really desirable. And I think it's one of the things we saw in the sphere is like all of these things are really, really important. So we need to find a new model, a new way of looking at things besides just simply the traditional way and see where we can work together. That's why in the sphere that I just showed everyone, we were able to see a surprising amount of agreement. So in psychology, when we work with couples, and when I work in, as management consultant, we work with communities. We use this in all kinds of applications. We're looking for strengths. Where do we have something to build upon that we can work together regardless of what we call ourselves? We call ourselves imp independent or Republican or liberal or whatever we call it, regardless. What can we work together on? We're on this. I mean, Buckminster Fuller called this spaceship Earth. And sometimes we forget that the resources here are limited. That as we keep putting more and more people, we have less breathable air, we have less usable water, we have less cultivatable land. We face some major issues. We've got to do things differently, and so I'm not a political expert. Politics is a critical component. It's a sector, as I refer to it in the sphere, but you and I are the, the ace. How much we get involved, what we do is going to change everything, or if we don't get involved, it won't change anything. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so I want to talk a little bit about that today, but I want to get some um, questions from the chat room. <laughs> um, there's a lot of concern about misinformation in the media, right? And I think that's one of the things that Coffee Party movement is actually consciously trying to do, is like what we're doing here, like kind of creating information and content that we could share. You know, because this is going to, we're videotaping it, we're going to upload it on YouTube, and we want to get this information out the best way we can, which is right now YouTube <laughs> and the internet. Um, now, it's a very enormous problem, a systematic problem, you know, that the, if we feel like people aren't informed enough. So part of the reason we're fighting is because, and, and you're right, we need to fight, but we're fighting each other. Right, it's, it's the problem, right? Uh, we identify, identify the wrong enemies, you know? And so how do we, how do we deal with this? You know, do we, is it, because I've been saying we have, to gener we have to kind of create our own content and get our, create our own information and data. But how do we, um, 
how do we combat this enormous problem of people being so misinformed and, and dealing with deliberate campaigns of misinformation? Because that really hurts our democracy, right? So that's a question for everybody. Yeah. Oh, I forgot I had the microphone. Wow. <laughs> um, my name is Dyer. I'm independent. I also work at, uh, here at Bus Boys and Poets. And um, I've noticed from dialogues between my friends and myself and even on uh, the news is you have two polar extremes. Like there's no middle ground. I've, I've yet to hear or very rarely ever hear any person try to pick a middle ground between the two opposing viewpoints. And it's very difficult for me because there are points, you know, conservatively that I agree to and there are, you know, points liberally that I agree to. And I feel that right now people are just feeding, you know, the, the furnaces of anger and frustration. And for, you know, the people at the tea parties, it's more of anger towards government and, you know, what's going on since, uh, since last year. And for Democrats or liberals, it's more of anger towards the Republican Party and the Tea Party. And it's, it's actually quite frustrating to see because, you know, we have, you know, on the right, Glenn Beck and Sarah Palin and Michelle Bachman going on and on and on. And then on the left, we have people like Bill Maher and, you know, uh, to some extent, you know, Keith Oberman and Rachel Maddow who downplay these people as, you know, morons and people who are, you know, just overt racist and not trying to find a reasoning of, hey, these are people who feel completely disenfranchised by their government. They feel that, you know, they've just been left behind. And for, you know, during the two terms of Bush, they were just happy to have a Republican, you know, a guy who, you know, was really religious and, you know, from the blue collar people. And all the stuff that he was doing, they just pushed aside. But now that we have a Democrat and also, you know, someone who has not completely broken the presidential trend, they're flipping out. They have no idea what to do, and they're also losing their jobs. So now they're just venting out, and they're being led and manipulated by these people and power to kind of fulfill their own aims. And when, if they even do get what they want, they're going to be so disenfranchised, possibly even more so. And I feel that on the left, people need to start having more dialogue, dialectics, and realize that you know it's not the people of the United States that needs to be fighting against each other. It needs to be the people of the United States fighting against our representatives that we elect. And then once they get into office, they just sit back and just enjoy the oligarchy that we have right now in, in, in the Capitol Hill. And it's, it's revolting to me. And I feel that we need to have more dialogues. And that's what I try to do with even like my friends who, are, who, I, who agree with me and who don't agree with me. We just talk and try to find issues and try to figure out a way to see things in a middle point of view. And I really want this to be more campaigned in the mass media so that this whole polarization can stop. You wanna, yes. I just want to share a, a little conversation that actually Annabelle and I had in the green room at, at CNN, at the bureau here in Washington, which was an issue about centrism. And I really want to, I want us to have a, a little bit of a conversation about this because See, I don't think that there is such a thing as centrism. I really don't. I think people have different positions on things, but it doesn't necessarily follow that if they have positions on the left, on the, you know, so, if they're socially conservative and fiscally responsible or whatever those categories are, that they fall in the center. Mm -hmm. So I actually don't believe that there is such a thing as moderation per se in terms of political standpoints. I think people can be moderate in their disposition, right? But I don't think there's a problem with having different views on things. In some ways, I'm with you, you know, having those conversations. You, you, know, you just have those conversations with people who have, you know, you agree with this person on that one and that one. But I don't think it follows. Because see, that keeps us in this left, center, right model, which I think is no longer applicable and is not helpful because it continues to keep us divided. I think we are in the process of a cultural transformation, small, where in the very beginnings, I think these conversations we're having are part of that. But I don't think that we should think, I don't think that there, it, I don't think it holds that, it, there, that there's this thing as the center. Because the center is a relative term. It's anything that's in between the, le the Democratic and Republican Party. But if they keep moving to the right, right, what does that mean? What does it mean to be a centrist in that kind of a situation? 
So I just wanted to share that because I think that, that was in, it's an important thing to raise. Yes. Um, I think the way I um, talked about it with Omar in the green room was that, um, and that's how we met actually. We were all supposed to be <laughs> on CNN talking about you know independent voters. Um, they ended up canceling because there was an earthquake, but we had a great chat. <laughs> um, I feel like the whole two-party system is like creates a really false dichotomy, meaning that it reduces every complex problem like healthcare debate into only two positions. And with some of these issues, we have to really think out of the box, and we're operating with the smallest possible box. With two options, often they're not that dissimilar, right? And it doesn't really help us advance, you know, really making serious changes or improvements. And so I guess that's the problem that I have with the two-party system is that cognitively we end up with only two options, right? And it also encourages people to think that it's like a football game or it's like ultimate fighting with two teams and it's always about winning and losing. Right. And we're, I think that that's just, that's not fundamental to a democracy. You know, democracy is supposed to be about community of people who come together to advance the common good. It's a collective decision making process. It's not inherently a football game or a fight. And that's how we imagine, that's how we understand politics. And when you turn on the news tonight, you know, all the, commentaries that you hear, all the punditry would be focused on this kind of, let's, it's like a sportscaster's talking about a sports game, you know, and, and everything is centered around a smackdown. People love smackdown stories, like, oh, this person got smacked down today. And you know what, that's not helping us. So, you know, that's the issue I have, and I completely agree with Omar that it's not about being in the middle, you know, it's about allowing diversity. Yes. <laughs> um, hi. Uh, this, uh, the analogy of uh, uh, marriage counsel is very good. Uh, we can sometimes become uh, paralyzed by analysis uh, as well. But the, uh, <clears throat> the, the anger that's out on the street uh, from whatever perspective is often real. It's, it's real motivation. It motivates people. It's to be able to channel that in a productive way is uh, is, a, is a big part of the challenge that we face and uh, trying to find achievable and uh, sensible uh, <clears throat> uh, solutions to the problems that face our dysfunctional political culture. Uh, so it, I guess what I'm getting around to, and I've been kind of working it out as I'm talking, is that we have, uh, uh, it's a fairly complex situation, and uh, we have the ability with, with recent uh, moves in technology to, to organize many people that wouldn't have been reached before and to reach them in a, in a time frame that was inaccessible. So, uh, in. Do you want us to respond? Okay. Oh, please, go ahead. I think I've chatted. Yeah. Um, and Nicole, do you want to? Um, sure. I think you bring up a terrific point about technology. Um, as we've seen, you know, the various media outlets, um, they've devoted so many resources to fact-checking just everything, you know, what they say in the Sunday show is what, like, you know, 11 AP reporters on Sarah Palin's book. Um, that's been really helpful to just call people on their overheated rhetoric. Um, I think that's been really useful. And I think we need to continue to do that. Um, the fact that you guys actually, you know, you just put the information out there. It's pretty incontestable that the U.S. has a national deficit of $12.8 trillion. That's there. You can't fight that fact. So mm -hmm. once you acknowledge, you know, once you get to that sort of common data, what do you do? What, the, what are the outcomes? I used to work at a think tank in coalition relations, and um, it was a libertarian, small l. Um, but I worked a lot with, um, with liberal groups on social issues, on the war, um, things like that. And it was, it was just useful to talk to people and say, okay, we both want the same outcome. We both want out of Iraq. We both want 
um, you know, ex ex expanded civil rights. We want, you know, decreased police power. Um, so how do we get to that? You know, you want it through a government solution. We want it through this solution. And just to, as you said, use rigorous analysis to analyze your policy options. It's actually, it's weird that we've gotten past a point where, you know, the scientific process has been around for 800 years, seven, you know. Um, and we've moved past that where we, we just go off, you know, the, the, we go off political, like, routes and options as opposed to actually, you know, what is the most scientific thing. So um, I think, you know, that that's really important. And then the next question. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Okay. Hi. Sorry. <laughs> My name is Julia, and I am actually a high school student. And so, a lot of what's going on right now isn't really targeted towards me. Yet, I'm following what's happening. I see what's going on with the party system, we have an overwhelming deficit, and I realize that in the future, my generation's really going to have to deal with a lot of the problems that are forming today. And there's a lot of exciting things that are building in our country, but how do you recommend that we continue to build support and engage people that are my age so that we can continue to progress in the future? Um, thank you for coming, um, it's great. Um, the most independent demographic, as Nicole was sharing with us and also is out there in multiple polls, is your, your age group, right? The 18 to 25 to 18 to 29 year olds is the most independent group across the board. I think that that bodes well for democracy. Um, in terms of engaging this demographic, I think you're it. I think that it requires people like you and us to continue to reach out in the ways that we can. I think the coffee party is doing some wonderful work in terms of just getting the message out there that you can do something, come to a meeting. It's, it's really fantastic. I'm really, really impressed. But I think that the issue underlying all of these issues, if you will, is democracy and greater participation. If we want a multiplicity of voices to be heard, mm -hmm. if we want to just have a conversation, we have to have a more open process. Mm -hmm. You'll forgive me for sounding like a broken record, but unless you deal with the structural issues, this is all in some ways just talk. And it's conversation, it's fun conversation. But you can exercise some strength. So for instance, with the November elections coming up, you can screen candidates. Ask them where they stand on political reform issues. Where do they stand on open primaries? Where do they stand on term limits? Where do they stand on opening things up so that more voices can come in? Mm -hmm. The interesting thing is that we're in a situation now where they need our support as independence small i. And we can exert some power, because it's about power. It's not just about civil, civil discourse for them. They don't really care about that. We care about it as citizens, as Americans, as people, right? We have to exert some power. And you have an organized base now. Mm -hmm. So you can bring together forums and ask candidates to come and say, hey, look, where do you stand on these issues? Not, I'm not talking about issues that are easy to respond to. Public education, oh, OK, that's easy. Yes, I'll, I'll ask for increased funding. Ask them, where do they support? Do they support open primaries, term limits? OK, if you want to include campaign finance, fine but structural issues, because until we open up the process, the American people are left out. So if we want to have a national dialogue, that's what we have to do, in my opinion. There's another question over, over there, I think, right. the gentleman. Uh, I'm in high school, so my name is Ankit, and I know we've been talking a lot about how to break the two-party system. My question is, um, how can we do that in like a big way? I know in Massachusetts and some of these other northeastern states, there's a lot of independent governors who are running and doing pretty well and they've elected some independent governors. So my question is how can we like expand that to the rest of the country and break this two party system? Expand what? Say that again? Uh, I was wondering how we can like break the two party system. You've been talking about that a lot. How we can. How we can break it up? Yeah. Okay, well, well I, I could go on for 14 days about this, but maybe somebody else should respond. I don't want to over, you know, sort of over, be overbearing in this conversation here. Well, I think, I, oh wait, that's your microphone. Okay. I think um, we definitely need to keep talking about this, but um, I think um, one of the things I want to talk about kind of in relation to that question is mm -hmm. the role of money in politics today, right? Because I think a lot of people feel that, well, they might feel better about the two parties if they felt like 
the two parties were loyal to the people and not, say, you know, special interest. Can you know, and so the reality of the fact that they need, to, like, you know, politicians need to be on a constant treadmill raising money, makes it very difficult for them to really represent their constituents because they have to think about how they're going to raise money, right? And so um, I'm wondering if, you know, how how we can sort of like approach that whole issue, like how do we actually? I guess that's how a lot of coffee party people talk about is like an issue of loyalty. They're not loyal to us. They're not serving us. Can, so maybe it wouldn't be so bad if they were actually loyal to us. What do you can, think about that? Um, yeah, I mean, I think information, you know, it's sunlight is the best disinfectant. All the information that's out there, all the disclosure rules, um, getting the money is fine, but just as long as you know where the money's coming from. I mean, there was some of the, um, one of the recent decisions um, saying that the chamber had to, you know, one of the, there's some lawsuit, there's some, one of the bills would be um, having the chamber disclose who they're giving money to. Fine. You know, I just want to know wh who is, where is my elected official's money coming from? And, and I can make my own decisions based on that because I think, you know, the Citizens United decision, um, obviously highly contentious, but at the end of the day, it, it gives organizations, um, it, it allows people to band money together in much the same way that uh, now a labor union can exercise the same influence that the New York Times has had. I'm from Chicago. The Chicago Tribune backing a candidate is like, that's gold. That's a huge endorsement. So if a bunch of people want to band together, you know, the fact that they were formerly restricted from doing that, mm -hmm. I don't have a problem with that. Um, but I just, I think we need to get as much information out there as possible so that people can say, all right, fine, you know, you took all this money, how are you acting? And then to hold them accountable for those decisions um, so that that's my my take on Phil. campaign finance yeah. Can, um, I, I think the coffee party itself its existence uh, comments on your question um, because your, your funding has been so nominal virtually none okay it's a as it says in the bottom of your emails an all-volunteer organization yes. okay so although there's been rumors people spread maliciously that it's funded by someone it's not it's volunteers, people come together. This is, I think, something that we want to really look at a little bit broader from a different perspective. Because we, we get back into this battle, okay, there's the, the left, there's the right, who's got more money, who can beat each other up the most? And money certainly allows you to do some things. But Annabelle, on the 28th or 27th of January, right, 26th of January, writes a Facebook page, 200,000 fans later, in so three months, three and a half months, no, two, two, yeah, two and a half, weeks. ten weeks. So in, in ten weeks, we're at this point, and it's not got corporate funding behind it. One of the things we need to look at, we need to look at the world differently. This is essential. Einstein said it before I was born, the consciousness that created the problems won't solve them. If we look at the world from a science standpoint, because we had two discussions about science and technology just a moment ago. If we look at it as a system, a small activity by one individual can have a huge impact. Now, Annabelle's shown this in a small degree, but I'll give you the, a much, much bigger example. Where did the World Wide Web come from? Nope. He only claims the internet. He didn't claim the World Wide Web. He claimed the internet. No. So we don't, the average person doesn't know. One person, a man named Tim Berners-Lee, Conceptualized in 1989, he wrote the first draft of what would be the World Wide Web. In March of 1990, he started by himself in CERN, where he was working, and he conceptualized it. He created the protocols, and by 1995, 1994, no, 95, we had the largest IPO in history up to that time as Netscape went, went live from one person giving away an idea that he built and built the protocols. The World Wide Web has changed everything in our world. On an unprecedented scale, one person did it. Annabelle writes a Facebook page. We're sitting here having this discussion. It's being broadcast live on the web. We, we're having discussions around the country, around the world. We have a lot more ability to influence things than we think. That's when you look at it from a system. This node is you. If you're disengaged, nothing will happen. It's going to continue exactly as it is, and it's going to get worse. If you're engaged here, and I'm engaged here, and Annabelle's engaged here, if we're all engaged, what we will do 
is beyond anything we can begin to imagine. Tim Berners-Lee had no clue there would be an Amazon or a YouTube or a Wikipedia. He had no vague clue. But when he took action, when he was engaged, it changed things. So I, I just want to share that money is, is an issue, but there are ways to have influence without money, and it's been proven over and over again. I, I just wanted to respond um, uh, just to this question about the money and politics. The, the corporations actually go to the parties, right? It's not the other way around. The corporations lobby the politicians. Mm -hmm. The issue, the, the, actually as it turns out, the parties have more power than the corporations, the way that the laws are set up. Okay. The way that we often talk about it is if the corporation, corporation, corporations, I'm all for like corporations not having excessive control. But the parties have more power than the corporations. Mm -hmm. They write the rules that keep them in power. Mm -hmm. So again, if we're going to deal with this issue of opening up the process, we have to go after the parties. People have tried to go after the money issue. We live in a capitalist society. There's this, there's this thinking. The, Sup the Supreme Court recently ruled that it was fine for corporations to fund all kinds of money for politicians. I think we're going, in some ways, that's not a battle that we're going to necessarily win. Maybe in the short term, and in the long term, maybe. But as it turns out, the rules that are set up by the two major parties in some ways make themselves much, much more powerful than any individual corporation, in fact, groups of corporations. Now that seems strange, but you think about it. Who goes to whom? It's not the politicians who go to the corporations. They get elected, and then they wait for people to come to them from the various corporations. That's why the corporations have all these lobbyists. What are they doing there? They're going to the parties to get what they want, after slipping them some money. So if we go after the structure, that's a way that we can get in the American people. Thing, what this does is this just it, it removes the parties from this even more I don't have to give money to the RNC anymore I can just give money I can give money I can get together with my friends and I can give money but I can cut the DNC the RNC all these other you know soft money hard money all that you can cut the parties out of this so if anything I think it's sort of a step in the right direction because it's much more you know it, it's more linear well, unfortunately, we do have to wrap up today, even though we're having this fascinating conversation. I think it just, there's just so much more we could talk about. We could spend hours talking about this. So I would love to talk to you guys again. I hope you, you know, continue to talk to the coffee party. And I think we have, um, we really have a grassroots movement right now. And it is purely grassroots. And we are completely independent of the parties. Um, they haven't even really approached us even, you know, which is surprising, you know, and, uh, or any other organization. So I feel like we're in a good place to really think about what's right for our country and really get people to stop thinking about being part of a party but work as just fellow Americans, right, with common goals, common problems, and just figure out how we're going to do this. So, you know, we would love to have you as, like, part of that you know, brainstorm. <laughs> and thank you so much, thank Phil, you. for coming f all the way from Denver to share the results of the sphere and explaining it all to us. And, and thank you, Nicole and Omar, for being part of this. And thank you so much for coming. We're going to continue this um, series, Candid Conversations, about our, our money, our values, and our government <laughs> for the next month or so. And so you can give us ideas about who you would like to see speak, and you know, we can approach them. So thank you, and I hope to uh, see you again soon. OK. Thank you. Thank you.